Felix here, and my cat, Squeaks, asked me this morning, Felix, what stocks do you think are going to beat the market in 2024? And I thought, that is a brilliant question, coming from a very, very small and furry creature, and let's answer that. There are five stocks that I think have a very good shot of beating the S&P royally, and I want to walk you through what those five are, give you the reasons, so that... You don't need to rely on me being right, but that you actually have the data points and you become a better investor. And I'll walk you through like why I think that. Before we do that, our mission here is very simple. We want to make a million people financially free. That's my goal. And to do that, you need to be able to make your money work for you. And I'll teach you how we do that. I'll teach you how simple trading can be in just three steps, trading just one stock. You don't have to study a million things out there. You just follow a rules-based automated process. Come and join me live this Tuesday at phoenixfriends.org slash webinar, and I'll teach you the entire process. We'll do some live trading together and everything else. So there we go. phoenixfriends.org slash webinar, also above, I believe. Now, Let's get uh, right right into it. We're going to get our hands dirty here with a couple of charts. And this first chart is SoFi, indeed. And why do I think that SoFi is going to do well this year? Well, there are a couple of reasons. The primary one is that SoFi is about to be included in the S&P 500. Sorry. No, that's a different stock that we're going to get to. So strike that. SoFi is about to be profitable. That's just a good step in the right direction towards the S&P inclusion, which could come in about a year and a half. I think that would be the earliest this is feasible. And then I look at the stock chart and people say to me, what, Phoenix, why didn't it break out above 10? I said, well, fairly obvious why. Uh, you know, the, the, the all-knowing, pompous banker in me says that. We've been there three times and we've just done it the fourth time. And it's a very, very cyclical stock. I mean, not cyclical, really volatile is the word I'm looking for. And it sort of bounces up and down like mad. So what would be a smart way to look at this? Well, there is actually an indicator here on this. And yes, I'm still here. And what you can see is that this is the RSI. It's an RSI 14. You can open this up in tradingview.com. It's free. And you can see that every time we're above, I'm just going to put a straight line in here, above this line, which is the 70 point line, when we're above that here, there, here, what happens to the stock? Stock bounces, bounce, bounce, there we go. See? And it says it's overbought. And it's a fairly simple indicator. Now, when would you want to buy the stock according to this indicator? Well, you could just take a, you know, long approach and just keep buying and nibbling. Or you could again maybe draw another line. Let me use another color here. Something a bit more brighter. Say green for buy. Of course, it's not a financial advice, just a thought. You could draw a line through, say here, 50 point line. So at 50 of the RSI and then say, well, I'm only going to nibble below it here and there and here and there. And then you'd be buying this dip and that dip and this dip the present dip, the previous dip, and that dip, and a little bit of this dip. Might be an interesting approach, right? So this is on a day chart, actually, because it's a very volatile stock. I sometimes show you this also for other bigger stocks on weeks charts. Might also work on a weeks chart. But yeah, you can just see like what's the setup that might actually work. RSI can be quite useful for this. Also something we use in trading. Now, Everybody hates SoFi because their tech platform apparently isn't gaining customers, it isn't you know, bringing people in and all that kind of thing. This is a chart uh, prepared by a wonderful account uh, called um, Data Driven Investing, I think it's called on Twitter. Normally he puts a thumbnail on there, uh, uh, but he hasn't this time. So, And what can you see that the tech platform has, yeah, revenue is sort of like not brilliant, but contributing profit has actually shot up very significantly. And that's really the story that SoFi needs to tell. I think they could do that a little bit better. Hopefully on the next earnings call, they will break this down a bit more. Uh, and I think that's ultimately what we should care about is like how much profit is this thing generating? Um, bear in mind, of course, it also powers SoFi. And then really the story is all about this. And again, Brad Freeman, it's a guy I've had him on the channel. Brilliant chap, follow his Twitter. 
And he says, we may, well, SoFi said today, we remain committed to continuing to deliver strong gap profitability and to growing tangible book value. And I love that. So yeah, they've fired 4% of workforce because they want to be more profitable. And there are new hire thousands of people. There's always going to be an element of people who are not really the right fit or initiatives and projects that are not really essential. And, you know, you can get rid of them. It's a good thing to do at the beginning of the year. Do, do a review. Not nice for those people, but hopefully they'll get another job. And if you look at on this chart here, and I'll zoom in as much as I possibly can, on the lower half in blue, we've got earnings per share estimates. And they've been minus nine cents, minus eight cents, minus seven cents, minus eight cents. And right now they're at zero. And of course the market is wrong because it's going to be a positive number at the earnings. And that is typically very, very good news. Have a look at what Tesla did when it became profitable. And of course, so far it isn't Tesla. I'm not saying it's going to behave the same way. But when it really properly became profitable, which was December 2019, they had some blips before. That's really when it became profitable. And at that point, Tesla was trading at about oh, $28, something like that. And then, well, you know what happened, right? It went up like 9x or something like that. And I'm not saying the same is going to happen to SoFi, but I'm just saying it's something the market likes because lots of investors only look at profitable companies because it's much, much easier to assess how good a profitable company is than to assess a startup that hasn't made any money yet. You haven't really got any metrics. So you're just going, I don't know. I like the CEO's hair. Um, Anthony Noto has got a very nice set of hair, doesn't he? So it's much harder to do. And therefore, a lot of investors just go, nah, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll, I'll, I won't take the risk. Can we trade it? Can we make money out of it? Well, yes. Now, of course, again, not financial advice. But if you go to optionswatch.io, there's a platform that we develop. And you have a look at this little setup here. Then you can see this trade here has a... $7.66 break even line. So we could actually, we can drop 10% and make money. Or we can go up any amount and we make money. And this could make us a 52% return maximum. And it's a trade set up just till after earning 16th of February. And you might not understand that in full. That's totally cool. But you can come and learn it with me, seriously, because they're just such nice opportunities. Imagine you can be wrong in the direction of a stock and make money. So I'd encourage you, first of all, get yourself a uh, free trial account at optionswatch.io. 30-day account. You can play around with it. That helps a lot to kind of open your eyes to what's possible. It's a platform that we built. And secondly, you know, go to Felix Friends of slash webinars, I stab myself in the face with this pen. Um, I would then have to sue, I don't know, whoever made the pen, of course, because, you know, it's not what they do in the US. <laughs> What's with this litigious thing going on there? Now, this chart here is a little faint, uh, but I'll, I'll make it a little bit greener for you. And there are two things on here that you can see. There is a green line here at $10, at $14, and then there is a great big line here at $8 and at $7. Now, this is 8, this is 7, and this is 10, and this is 14 all dollars. What does that mean? It means here at $8, we've got support. That's where SOP and ORT. Uh, that's where SOP and ORT sit, and it is hard to break below those lines because the market makers, the dealers have to buy at $8 and at $7. And that's because they put options there. And again, it's, it's options. Sorry, it is, but it's really, really important. And then on the way up, well, it's a little harder to break through 10 and to 14, and those will act as resistance marks. So something to know and to note and to put it on your stock chart and something you can look up again in optionswatch.io. Did I mention you should get yourself a free trial? I think it probably did, didn't I? Go do it. Optionswatch.io. Well worth it. Links down below as well. Now, the next stock, and this is one of my favorites, honestly. And I did a video on this last year, and a lot of people saying who and all that kind of thing. And they didn't have a great year. Honestly, they didn't. They closed the year 19% down. 
but it doesn't make it any less of a great business. And hopefully by now you figured out a lot of the time the things the market hates are actually probably the things to buy. And we've got a couple of those in here. Metla Toledo makes, makes lab equipment, precision measuring equipment. So if you want to make you know, tablets or something, and you want to make sure that they're exactly to the microgram, the right height and weight and size and shape and that kind of thing, then you go to Metla Toledo. And if you have a laboratory, you go there. So why haven't they done brilliantly last year? Well, it's the end of COVID and the world had kind of stocked up on laboratory equipment, like, like a lot. Like you thought people bought a lot of, um, what are those lunatic bikes people were on during COVID? Um, no, people also bought a lot of lab equipment. Not people, of course, but labs and governments and everybody started a lab who could. So they've had a massive increase in earnings per share. And then it's dropped down a little bit, this lack of demand, really. Um, and that's normal. Uh, but still, the business is a glorious one. And if you look at the longer term, and I'll make this full screen again, in the bottom half here in blue I've got earnings per share, uh, and you can just see it's just, I mean, it's just a glorious line up. This, this business is like 100 years old, and they just get more profitable every single single year. It's just insane. So I think they're doing very, very well. And yeah, these um, highs up here, uh, we might not get there for a little while again, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a really good business, in my opinion. And I'll tell you just how much, how good it is. Um, an A for profit health is always what makes me you know, jump up and down and go, yay, whoopity doo. Um, it's growing very nicely. Cash flow is amazing. It's not massively overpriced, I don't think. Uh, and it probably doesn't really matter whether it is because it's a man, you know, they're a manufacturer, these guys. They actually make stuff. They've got a 60% gross profit margin. That's pretty hard to do. Look at revenue here, how, how that's exploded. They're making almost 900 million real hard cash profits on that. They have a 13% profit growth rate. So, yeah, I just like it. This is one of those businesses that it's always going to be around. And, you know, when you buy lab equipment, you've got, a, you've got a maintenance contract, right? You need spare parts. You need maintenance. You need calibration, all that stuff. If weighing machines, you need calibration. So it's just, it's just a really good business. Now, the next one, uh, this is more about, you know, shampoos and that sort of thing, L'Oreal. And L'Oreal, unlike Estee Lauder, who, I'm going to say something rude there, uh, very incompetently handled the post-COVID world and the slowdown in Chinese consumption. The uh, L'Oreal did it brilliantly, and they have uh, an A star for profit and a B for growth health, B for cash flow, which is all pretty good. And relative value at D is actually quite good. There is an E and there is an F on the score. So D is like not insanely overpriced. And look at this. Gross profit margin is 73%. So they're selling you, you know, water and soap in a bottle uh, for crazy prices. They have a 16% return on invested capital, which is just like they can actually invest their money into their own business and make 16% a year. That's, that's not too shabby, right? Try doing that with a condo. The profits are going up 10%. Uh, profits are actually $6 billion a year now, which is bonkers out of 44 re billion revenue for manufacturer, all the distribution costs and so on. That's pretty impressive. And have a look again down here at earnings per share, just just going up and up and up and up and up some more. But we're trading up here. So we're not, it's not super cheap. It just isn't. It's just a good stock. It's done really, really well. And all the, you know, Estee Lauder sufferers have, have gone and bought L'Oreal instead. That's probably got something to do with it as well. And um, yeah, that's kind of my view on that one. When would you buy it? Well, yeah, you could wait for a pullback. I'm not sure it's going to come, to be honest with you, but you could. You could say, I'm going to wait till it drops below the 100 day moving average line or something like that. Possible. Um, and then maybe come up some sort of nibbling approach. I'm not saying you should buy the stock, of course, either. And then we've got almost last, but definitely not least. And, and, and there is one more after this Palantir. Now, Palantir has actually had a very, very good year. They ended the year at 130% up. So that's pretty good. Now, they had a fairly miserable period before that. So that kind of explains the big move. And how would I say is a good way to buy this? And not financial advice, but if you pull up, and this is a day chart, if you pull up something called STDEV, so I'll write it on here, standard deviation. And if you 
remember maths, you'll remember what that is. It basically says to you, is this a more than a normal move? And when it's a, a bigger than a normal move, it'll be like more than a standard deviation out. And it's a, an event that doesn't happen that often. So what you could do is on the way up, when we are above in this purple line I've drawn in here is at one standard deviation, one. When you go above it, well, you can halt. When you are below it and the stock has tanked somewhat, then you could nibble below it. So you could be nibbling in like this zone up here. Let me, let's make it green. Make this, the nibbling in green. So this would have been all a nibble at fairly low price points. There would have been a bit of nibbling up here and a bit of nibbling at the sort of sideways action and a touch of nibbling at each of the bottoms of the dips. And that's not a bad place to buy considering how much higher the stock actually went. And if you wanted to be a little bit more sophisticated about this, then you could also start to sell when it goes higher. So you could say, well, when it goes up, when it rallies up here and it goes above one standard deviation, either I sell or what I would do is I would set up a trailing stop loss. Fairly tight. So maybe 5% or something like that. Depends on how much of a gain you've had, of course. Um, a couple of percentage points below where you are so that when you are then moving up, as you move up, if this is your stop loss, you move up some more, stop loss moves up. You move up some more, stop loss moves up. You come down and then boom, it sells you out. And by selling here, you've collected all of this profit zone and you could rinse and repeat the same sort of process. So that's, that might be an approach to, to deal with this. You could, of course, also simply just acquire the stock for the long run. Could we trade it? Well, there is something very exciting coming up. I was so excited about it. I mentioned it in the first 30 seconds of this video. And that is Palantir will be included in the S&P 500. Palantir will be included in the S&P 500. Palantir will be included in the S&P 500. Yes, I know I could say that many times. It's, isn't that marvelous? What will that do? Two things. Money will pour in, about 5% of the market cap, something like that. And that money is more stable money. It doesn't leave as quickly. So it makes the stock less bonkers. It makes it a little bit more stable. And we know that's going to happen at the end of March or early April. And therefore, we could set up a trade for the 19th of April, which is up here. And the simplest thing, quite frankly, would be to just buy a call option. And that would cost you $200, $206 to be precise. And if you say went up to $21, like the previous peak here, you would be making a 97% profit. So it's, and if you go higher, you make, you make more. So it's a, it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, could we do something better? Well, we could do something a bit more conservative. And I always, always look for it. It's like, is there something that we could do that's a bit more conservative? We could set up what we call a bull put spread. And again, if this is gobbledygook to you, then just, just listen. And the more you listen, the more it becomes something that is actually logical. And the beauty with this one is, and who she is a beauty, is that our break even at this trade is the recent low, the November low. So our break even is at, break even is at $14.67 or a whopping minus 12% below the current share price. So I'm saying S&P inclusion, money's going to go in and the stock could drop 12% and I'd still make money. Kind of bonkers, isn't it? If it goes up, I, of course, also make money. How much money do we make? We could make potentially 50% upside. Not bad. This trade would cost only $66 to set up. So again, a little bit more, you know, uh, conservative. But um, yeah, that's the sort of thing I'd love you to understand. Seriously, come and join me on Tuesday Live and I'll teach you exactly how this actually works. Uh, FelixFriends.org slash webinar. It'll take about an hour. And also go get yourself a free 30-day trial with optionswatch.io, which is the screenshot here, just so you can play around with these and under start to understand these things yourself. What's last but not least? It is the great blue giant, the elephant in the room. It is PayPal, 
who had a pretty miserable year, about minus 20% last year, having tumbled about 80% the year before. And people might then go, it's terrible, it's going to go down forever, and what do I do? Well, have a look at this. Have a look at this. What have I got on here? I've got the stock chart, and then I've got, wait for the excitement. Oh, down below, EPS down here for the year and also earnings per share for the quarter. And what can you see? Well, we're trading at 2017 levels. I kid you not. That's where we're trading. And in 2017, PayPal was making about $1.50 a share. Right now, it's making about $5 per share. So it's trading at the same price and is more than three times as profitable. Logic, if you think they're going to go out of business with all that free cash flow and all that money and that dominant market share, which makes a lot of sense. Well, they had a CEO who was so repellent that nobody liked the stock. They have this new CEO who's charming and lovely and handsome and, and a wonderful man. Actually, I don't know if that's the case, but you know, you can't be worse than the last one. And he has got the job of turning this ocean liner around. And that's going to take some time. How long is that going to take? Well, does it matter? If you have a long-term approach, like my cat Squeaks back there, who's a very long-term approach to naps. How many hours do you think she's napped today? I would say eight. <laughs> and the day is not as young. If you bought Pala, uh, PayPal today, why are all my thoughts always on Pala here? If you bought PayPal today, you'd be paying a 12 times PE ratio. So it would take 12 years of profits to pay back your share price. If you hold on to that for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years, you'd be holding PayPal. This is based on the miserable, moribund, idiotic analysts who think PayPal is going to grow at about 10% a year or thereabouts. You'd be holding it at, at, at a 3x. So basically, just by holding it for nine years, you own something that actually generates 33% of your share price. You paid for it every single year in profits. Do you say that's going to be overpriced? No. It's, of course, a chance that, you know, a rock will hit PayPal headquarters and it'll go out of business, entirely possible. But it seems like, well, a punt I might be willing to take. How could we set this up? Well, again, I look at my RSI, and I'm going to make this as big as humanly possible. And I've got two lines in here. I've got a red line. This is a stock that's come down this much, and it's, you know, a lot. It's hard to therefore go, oh, we should buy at these prices. Well, you see that it peaks out literally when every time the RSI hits 70. There. And that's, that was here. And then we got close to it here, and we've got, again, a peak. And when's a good buy opportunity? Well, it might just be below the 50-point line on the RSI, which would mean you'd be nibbling sort of around here, which would be the equivalent of nibbling there. You would have nibbled fairly hard down here. You would have nibbled there. And you would have nibbled here. And um, maybe a little bit there. And you're saying, yeah, but Felix, I still lost money. You're, you're quite right. You, you're still down. But you at least didn't buy this kind of blue miserable zone every time it went up. So you've not done as badly as you would have otherwise done. So it might be an approach to 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 look at, to play around with the RSI on, on, on this one. Um, there is a reminder for me to tell you to get yourself a free trial of options. What should I, in case I hadn't mentioned it yet on this video. <laughs> and uh, seriously, also uh, sign up for the live trading training on Tuesday. It'll be a hoot. It takes about an hour. I'll walk you through how we do it, why we do it, how it functions. We do some live trades together. And you can ask me the really difficult questions, which you might enjoy. FelixFriends.org slash webinars. So think about a difficult question about, you know, how many hours my cats sleep or that sort of thing. And 
What's next? Well, if you enjoyed this video, then I'll put out a video, actually, even a series of videos, if you, if you, if you so, so choose, that break down for you how we actually make analysis on stocks. What's actually a good stock? What's a good stock? What's a bad stock? How do you define it? What are the couple of criteria we look at? What should we track? And all that kind of good stuff. And I'll share with you the, all the kind of stuff that I learned as a, as, a, as a banker and as an investor and trader since. Thank you for watching. Smash the you know what, and I'll see you live. Now, you might have heard of one or two of these, but the other ones you probably have absolutely never heard of. And I'll explain to you why these are great businesses. I've also put together all of my research and the full benchmark at felixfriends.org slash gems. You can download it. It's absolutely free. 